Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, Great City Church. How are we going? Good, good. Well, I just want to start. My name is uh, Hugh, and I'm one of the elders here at Great City Church. And I just want to add my welcome that's already been given, especially if you're here for the first time. And as Adrian said, if, if you're joining us, we're in the middle of, a, middle of a series from the book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible, and it's called The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you haven't been following the series, perhaps this is your first time, then it's, it's, that's totally fine, because if you like, this morning's story just kind of stands alone. If you've been following it, it will connect in with what's gone before and what will come after, but if it's, this is your first time, actually, it's just a single story that stands alone. The story that we are looking at is quite long. It's almost 70 verses, which is quite long. And I thought, since it's a story, rather than me telling you what happens in the story and spoiling it all, I thought maybe we could just kind of read through it together as we go and just take our time to tell the story. Does that sound good? Yeah. It sounds a bit more interesting than just me giving you the answers. So it's from Genesis chapter 24. And because it's long, I'm going to read some of it, and I'm going to explain some of it to save a little bit of time. And I've sp- Splitting the story down effectively into four scenes, if you like, so that it's clear. And if you're attending church for the very first time, you know, you can just jump straight in with this one. It's going to be quite straightforward. But before we get into the story, why don't I start by praying? God, I thank you that you are so, so good. And I thank you that you are so, so faithful. And I thank you, Lord God, that you are our refuge, you're our strength, you're our firm foundation, Lord God, that we can come and find such security and strength in you. And I just pray for this morning, Lord God, that you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord God, that you would encourage us in our faith, Lord God, that you'd strengthen us and bless us here at Grace City. And for me, Lord God, just fill me with your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to start then by reading the story. I'm going to read verses 1 to 9. That's Genesis chapter 24. You can turn on your device or your Bible or it should appear behind me. So it starts. Abraham was now very old and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living. Sorry, you will not get a daughter for my son. That's important. But you will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant asked him, What if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son to the country you came from? Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me on oath, saying, To your offspring I will give you this land. He will send an angel before you, so that you can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Now I've called this scene, like scene one, the problem. But I just want to start by saying, you know, Abraham is old, his son Isaac is 40 and single, and it's traditional arranged marriages that fathers would find partners for their brides. But I want to clarify that being single is not a problem, generally speaking. What's going on in this story is that Abraham knows he's going to pass away soon. He's not got long left to live. Actually, in the the next part of the story, he passes away. But God's given him a promise that his family will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. But there's one thing kind of blocking that. The son that God has chosen um, to be part of this inheritance, Isaac, hasn't got a mate, which means that he can't mate, which means the promise can't be fulfilled. So that's the problem in this scenario. But I do just want to clearly say being single is not a problem. and It's not something that needs to be resolved or fixed. And um, I want to be clear on that because in a church like this, lots of families, actually it can be difficult to be single. I know there's people who are part of this church community who aren't able to come on Sundays or they choose not to because actually they find it so difficult that we're all here together but everyone else goes home with their family and that they go home alone. And it can be really difficult in singles to be single in a context like this. And I just want to say it's, it's not a problem. And we're going to talk about it more later, but we've all got to believe we are where we are because that's exactly where God wants us to be at this point in time. And it's not something that needs to be resolved or fixed. No, you are where you are because God has chosen you to be there. 
So Abraham selects a servant for this task. Not just any servant, but his most trusted servant. And it makes him put his hand under his thigh, which is extremely close and personal, don't you think? I mean, I imagine them kind of sitting down together and, you know, kind of reach around the knee and grabbing the thigh. And if you're reading the story of Abraham looking for leadership principles to take into your workplace, don't do this. It's, it's weird. Your employees don't need to touch your thigh. But what I would say is, it, what it communicates is that actually this is a really big deal. It's important. Now for Abraham, this is more than a handshake or an exchanging of thongs, which they used to do. Actually, this is, I really mean this. I want you to get up close and touch me and promise me that you're going to do this because it's really important. So then we move on to scene two. And uh, I've called it, so, do you come here often? Uh, I just couldn't think of another, anything better. I think if I, if, if I thought more about it, I would change that. But what happens is the servant sets off on his journey. It's a 600K trip. He's got a train of camels. He's got a whole load of other servants. And he's got a shed load of gold. And he, uh, he heads in the general direction where he thinks Abraham's family will be. You know, he's not got GPS or a map or any road signs. But he stumbles across a village, and at the edge of the village is a well. And he has arrived at exactly the right time, because it's, the sun's about to set, and it's the time that the women come out to the well to grab water for the family. So he begins to pray, and I read verses 12 and 14. Then the servant prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the town people are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to your master. And the Bible says, even before he finished praying, this woman appears on the horizon. And I don't know if I've got a kind of over-romanticized picture of what this looks like, but in my head, you know, like the sun's kind of setting and her silhouette is against the, the sunset, you know, like their hips are swaying. There's like a gentle breeze, you know, just gently blowing her hair back. It's like a, you know, like L'Oreal, you know, because she's worth it sort of thing. And I picture... The music for me is Lionel Richie, um, <laughs> Endless Love. I don't know what you... But that's what I think. And this woman appears, and it happens to be Rebecca. And uh, she, so he, he uses his line. He goes to her, and he says, Hey, can I have a drink of water? And then she says, Yes, you can have a drink of water, and I'll give water to all your camels too. So he's like, Yes, she's the one. Swipes right, if you like. She is a keeper. <laughs> So they, they get chatting and stuff, and he realizes that Rebecca is actually part of Abraham's family. She's the one that he's been looking for, and she arrives at exactly the right time at this well. And uh, he gives her some gold. He explains why he's there. And in verse 27, he says, Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relative. And he says, the Lord has led me. I was just, when I was reading, I thought, well, well, has he really led him? Like, I mean, if you, I know we haven't read all the verses, but Abraham spoke of angels, but is there any speak of angels here? No. Does God actually turn up and say, hey, you need to go to this place at this time? Does God say anything to him at all? Actually, God doesn't say anything. If you like, God doesn't seem to lead that clearly. But at the same time, this isn't just coincidence that he traveled all the way through this land and he happens to arrive in a huge space, exactly the right village, exactly the right well, at exactly the right moment when this woman's coming out and she does exactly what he prayed that she would. We've got to understand that actually God is so controlling this situation. Like God is orchestrating the whole thing. So there's kind of a foreground, if you like, where God doesn't seem to be saying or leading directly the servant, but actually in the background, he's controlling and dictating the whole thing. And we'll look at that more as we move through the story. So we move on to scene three. I've called it Meet the Family. So uh, after 
the servant's encounter with Rebecca, she runs back to the family and says what's gone on. And I'll read from verses 29 to 33. It says, Now Rebecca had a brother named Laban, and he hurried out to meet the man at the spring. As soon as he had seen the nose ring and the bracelets on the sister's arms and had heard Rebecca tell what the man said to her, he went out to the man and found him standing by the camels near the spring. Come, you you who are blessed by the Lord, he said. Why are you standing out here? I've prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man went to the house and the camels were unloaded. Straw and fodder were brought for the camels and water for him and his men to wash their feet. The food was set before him, but he said, I will not eat until I told you what I have to say. Then tell us, Laban said. And then the servant relays the whole story, which you know, we've just mentioned. You know, I was walking, I was at the well, this woman came, da 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 that story. And Laban and the family are just totally convinced that this is God. And they say, well, this is God. Verse 51, here is Rebekah, take her and go. And let her become the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has directed. When Abraham's servant heard what they said, he bowed down to the ground before the Lord. So they're just like, yep, this is God. Here's Rebecca. Take her. You can go. And uh, you may think, well, that sounds a bit kind of harsh on Rebecca. But actually, um, when we look kind of through this story, she's painted in a a really good light, I think. Um, She's... I think, hardworking and diligent in the fact that she's the one going to get water for the entire family. I think that she's generous in the sense that she offers not just to give him a drink, but all of his camels too. I think that she's quite strong-willed and adventurous because as the story goes on, the servant is like, well, this is God. Let's take the, I'm taking the woman now. We're going. And the family's like, well, you know, can't we just have her for 10 days more? You know, that would be nice. And um, the servant's like, well, you can ask her. So they go up to her and ask her, Rebecca, you know, what, do you want to go with this man? Which is really unusual in a, an arranged marriage situation. You don't get that choice. But she's given a choice, and she said, yes, I do want to go with him. So she makes quite a big, kind of bold, brave decision. And in comparison to Isaac, who really, he doesn't really get a choice. The woman shows up, and that's, that's his woman, and um, we'll see if it works out. So I just wanted to, to draw your attention. Actually, Rebecca is pointed, sorry, painted in a really quite a good light. But the servant is excited, his mission is accomplished, you know, he gives gifts, they eat, they drink, and they celebrate. And then we move on to the last scene for this morning, and I've called it the look of love. (laughs) So the servant sets out, uh, he takes Rebecca with him back to Abraham, and then for the first time in the story, we meet Isaac. Uh, Verse 63 This is talking about Isaac. He said, he went out to the field one evening to meditate. So he's just gone out to pray. You know, what a good guy. And as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac. That's the the look of love. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all that he had done. Isaac brought her into his tent of his mother Sarah, and he married Rebekah, so she became his wife, and he loved her. Oh, it's, an, it's a nice story, isn't it? It's quite, a, it's quite a unique story, actually. I don't think there's another like it in the Bible explaining how a, how a couple actually got together. But um, we have to ask, well, what does, they, what does this kind of mean for us today? What's the relevance for us now? And I think... In some places in the Bible, things about God are really clearly stated, like saying God is love or God is kind. But in stories like this, narratives like this, nothing about God is ever clearly stated, but what we get to see is what God's characteristics look like in everyday life. So let me explain. The Bible says God is love, but what does that look like? Well, probably the best place to go would be to look at the life of Jesus, That's what love looks like in an everyday context. It's compassionate, it's generous, it's kind, it's unselfish. We get to see not just uh, a concept about God stated that he's loving, but we get to see it in real life. So what's the concept then that is being illustrated in this story? I feel there's a number probably, but the main one is what I'm calling the providence of God. And that means effectively that God is in control of absolutely everything. He preserves, governs, and directs everything in the universe 
all the time to always accomplish his purposes. There is nothing that happens that is outside the control of God. So do we find that concept in the Bible stated elsewhere? Actually, it's all over the Bible, but I'll draw your attention to some particular verses. Ephesians 1.11 says, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. He's saying everything that happens, God works it out so that it conforms with his purpose and his will. Nothing happens that doesn't fit into the will of God. Romans 8.28, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. Everything that happens, all things, God works it for good. Proverbs 16.9, We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. You know, we can... Do things, we can decide things, but it's actually God who's determining our steps. Before we even think it, actually, He's determined what's going to happen next. And He's in control over creation. Hebrews 1 3 says that God is sustaining all things by His powerful word. You know, we have uh, science to thank for the knowledge an understanding of how the world works, but sometimes I think we can forget that it's not just something that God's pressed play on, but actually, it's being sustained by Him all the time. He's keeping the whole thing going, and without him, everything would fall apart. We see this explained in uh, Job 37. I don't think this will appear on the screen, but verse 6 says, God says to the snow, fall on the earth, and to the rain shower, be a mighty downpour. In verse 10 to 12, it says, the breath of God produces ice, and the broad waters become frozen. He loads the clouds with moisture, He scatters his lightning through them. At his direction, they swirl around over the face of the whole earth to do whatever he commands them. Now, God is sovereignly in control of all creation all the time. And he's even in charge of chance. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. A casting a lot is when they used to... um, if you like, have a collection of bones, they need to decide something, shake the bones, throw it on the floor, and whatever the bones say, that's what they do. It's a bit like, you know, who's going to take the rubbish out tonight? Let's do scissors, paper, rock to decide. It's that kind of thing. And, um, you know, one passage of Scripture that surprises me every single time I read it, when the apostles need to find someone to replace Judas, I'd be thinking, it's the last one went badly wrong. We need to make sure that we find someone who's really good this time. And someone else, yeah, absolutely. We need, uh, we need to get some CVs. We need a 10-stage interview process. We need, to, we need to have a three-year kind of plan. But they don't. They just cast a lot. And they pick whoever it falls on. It's like, who's going to be the next apostle? This is a paper rock. Oh, it's you. And then when we take up elders next... No, I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> but for us, it may seem like, well, you're just putting it down to chance. Actually, for them, it was an act of faith. They totally believed that God controlled the outcome. They absolutely trusted him that he would lead them. So it wasn't chance. It was trust in the faithfulness of God. So it's clearly this concept of God being in control of everything is something that's referenced right throughout Scripture. But then reading back into the story, where do we see it at work? And I think the kind of question that you know, I have, if God's in control of everything, if before I even think it, he's directing my steps then am I just like a puppet who God is controlling the whole time, just doing everything he wants without even knowing it? Well, as when we look at the story to see what this actually looks like, I don't think that's the case. You know, for example, does God ask Abraham to find a wife for his son? No, he doesn't. Abraham just decides that that's what needs to happen. Does God tell Abraham where to find his wife? No, he doesn't. Abraham just decides. And he makes a godly decision to find a believing wife from his family rather than someone locally. Does God tell Abraham who to send? You need to pick this person. No, Abraham just chooses someone he trusts. He makes a good decision. Does God lead the servant via some sort of special map or some kind of prophetic word? You need to be here at this place, turn right when you get to this. No, the servant just goes the way that he thinks is best. You get the idea where I'm going. All these people make real decisions. They decide for themselves about what they think is best. 
You know, that's in the foreground, if you like, people making real decisions. But actually, when we step back, somehow God is in control in absolutely every one of those decisions and is guiding and dictating the whole thing so that everything works out in conformity to his will. So I think that story teaches a loss, a, us a lot about our life, that God is in control. And uh, we make decisions, they're real decisions, but actually all the time it's God who's leading us. So when you go to work tomorrow, you sit at your desk, or you begin the, begin the craziness of the school run, or you sit down in class, or perhaps you start to procrastinate studying for those exams that you've got this week. Actually, you can know you're in exactly the place God wants you to be. You know, it's not just that you decided this career or that you just got accepted into this school or a series of random chances that brings you to where you are. God has been directing your steps the whole time. You are exactly where he wants you to be. And this is particularly important when we go through difficult times. So what if you haven't got a job? Or what if you really hate your job? Or what if you didn't imagine yourself being a mum at this stage of life? Or what if you'd love to be a mum, but you can't? What if you are single? You know, we've got to believe that you're not single because there's just a lack of single people your age in this church or because it's something to do with you. Actually, there's huge assurance for us in knowing that we are exactly where God wants us to be. This isn't chance. Actually, he's controlling and he's leading us the entire time. It brings us such peace and comfort. And I think especially after the kind of the news that we've had this week, we think about Jackie passing away. You know, been helping kind of organize the service for next week and people have been ringing up who knew Jackie, just sharing their memories of her. And um, lots of people have sent pictures of the the kind of times in their life that they've spent with Jackie. And it's just been really, it's just been really sad. It's just really hard. And um, you think she she was a mum who should have been alive for a lot longer. You know, she's left teenage kids behind. You think, you know, the, the truth is that God could have healed her in a second. You know, he could have healed her in a second. But he, he didn't. And it's kind of hard to reconcile the fact, but we've got to believe that God was in control the whole time and is in control. And that he works out everything so that it conforms with his will and his purposes. And that may be hard to kind of believe, but it's a far scarier prospect, I think, to believe than that God's not in control. Actually, that this is something that defeated him. Because you know, if God's not in control, if he's powerless against evil, then we really, we really are in trouble. So that as difficult as it may be, we've got to believe that God was sovereign, that he was totally in control the entire time. And this somehow fits within his will and the fulfillment of his plans and his purposes. But that does leave us with real questions as to why. You know, why, you know, why didn't God answer prayer? You know, God, why didn't you heal? And the truth is, you know, uh, there's some questions that we're never going to get answers to this side of heaven. There's some things that we're never going to be able to understand or fully comprehend. Someone once said, um, when a train goes into the tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off the train. So you keep going and you wait until you come into the light. And we have to trust God. But we do have real questions. We've been looking at um, Psalm 22, and it's just been really helpful. Someone who's voicing their kind of questions to God. In verse 1, it starts by saying, My God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me? Now, we don't have many worship songs that start with that kind of 
uplifting line. And it goes on in verse 2, you know, I cried out to you, but you did not answer. Verses 4 and 5, he's saying, you know, my ancestors put their trust in you. You, They prayed to you. You heard their prayers. But in verse 6, he says, but I'm just a worm of a man. He's like saying, you know, God, where are you? Why don't you answer my prayers? Other people prayed to you. They cried out to you, and you heard them. But me, I'm just like a worm. Am I not important enough that you'd hear and answer my prayers? And I think it's amazing that God allows verses like these to even be in the Bible where he's allowing people to almost openly pour out their heart and challenge God on why he hasn't done what they thought he should do. God allows people to express anger and frustration at God. God's so humble, he's so amazing. And I think for us it gives us freedom and liberty and maybe even an invitation to express our frustration and vent and just let loose at God sometimes and say, I don't know why this is happening. You know, why don't you hear my prayers? Why don't you answer me? You answer other people's prayers. You hear other people. You heal them. But am I just a worm that you don't answer me? And I'd encourage you as you kind of bring these things to God, you know, it's great to do it with kind of reverence and a sense of the holiness and how much bigger God is than you. But I know there's been times in my life where I haven't quite achieved that kind of attitude. But God's big enough to kind of cope and to manage our frustrations. He can deal with that. So I think in the foreground of our lives, you know, there can be things that are... We don't know why God is doing what he's doing. And he may seem really absent and like he's just not involved or not doing or saying anything. But this story teaches us that maybe our experience in the foreground, but in the background, God is totally in control the entire time. He knows exactly what he's doing, and everything works to accomplish his purposes. And I'm going to kind of begin to come to a conclusion with this kind of last question, if the band could come up, actually. Going back to this story, there's one thing that kind of puzzled me about the story as I was reading it. And... um, We've laid it out with these kind of four scenes, uh, like a play or a movie. And you'd ask yourself, in a movie, you know, there's always one kind of central character. Who's the kind of the main character in this story? So it's definitely not Abraham, because he's just in it for a few verses at the beginning. It's not Isaac, because he's in it for like four verses at the very end. And the person who's in it the whole way through actually is the servant. He's in it from like verse one till the very end. Actually, he says so much more than Isaac says in the whole of the Bible. Uh, Up until this point, Isaac said, I think, maybe two sentences. And he doesn't do much more. I think in the next chapter, he's a bit of a coward, and he lets other people sleep with his wife. Um, And then he has some kids, and he favors one above the other, and it causes kind of huge family stress. And then he passes away. That's that's Isaac for you. (laughs) But the main character in this story is actually the servant. And what kind of puzzled me about the story was, you know, we don't know anything about the servant. Like, we don't even get to know his name. Like, God, actually, you know, why didn't you tell us anything about the servant? Like, why didn't you even give us his name? I mean, he's a good guy. He's willing to touch Abraham's thigh. He's, <laughs> he, you know, he's, he's praying. He's in faith. He's so diligent. He's a great guy, actually. But God never, ever mentions his name. And I was thinking about this, and I suppose the only thing that I thought was, actually, kind of God didn't want to mention his name because the story is not really about him, even though he's the main character. It's not really about a good servant. Actually, the central topic, the central character of the story is God. It's a story of his faithfulness, that he will do everything that he said he promised he would do. And he, he's the God of Abraham and Isaac, not because they are necessarily amazing, awesome people, but because God is a God who is gracious and faithful, and he aligns himself to people that aren't perfect, and he's happy to be identified with those people. This story is a story of the amazing faithfulness of God. It's a story of God's control over all situations and circumstances. And I believe for us, just there's huge comfort in that, actually, knowing that our lives, it's not really the story of us. It's the story of him. It's the story of his amazing grace, his amazing love. And 
his faithfulness to us and his total control in every single circumstances of our lives. And I just hope that that brings you some peace and some comfort wherever you are this week. But I think it'd be great just to end by just worshiping this amazing, awesome God. So why don't you stand with me? I'll just, I'll just pray for us before we begin.